Um, so I'm going to go through the early development of photography in India, um, really very superficially, because I could drone on about it for uh, days and days and still have barely scratched the surface. But this is a, a brief introduction to the subject. So I'll crack right on and start. And um, right, the invention of photography, which happened over a period by several different inventors in Europe in the 1830s, uh, the two ultimately famous ones both publicized their process at the end of the 1830s um, in January 1839. And the two of them were William Henry Fox Talbot in England and Louis Mande Daguerre in France. And they both in pretty much invented photography, but by two very differing processes, which I'll run through very fleetingly. The daguerreotype invented in France involved taking a photograph on a sil silver plated copper plate, um, which produced a very fine image, but was almost impossible to reproduce. So the photographs were just a, every much a one off. And you had to go back to the camera and produce another one if you needed another copy. The process that Fox Talbot invented, the color type or Talbot type, involved producing a negative image on a sheet of paper, which was then waxed to make it translucent and could then be printed on to another sheet of paper to give you a positive image. So this gave you the option to be able to produce multiple prints from one original negative, which was the basis of all future photography, really. Um, both men announced publicly their invention in January 1839, though they'd both been working on it for several years beforehand, um, but were in competition with each other to make announcement of it and get the kudos of uh, publicity for it. Um, by October 1839, news of it had gone around the world and had arrived in India. And by October 1839, the first experimental photographs were being taken by scientific amateurs in Calcutta and in Bombay. Right. The first known photographer in India was Dr later to become Sir William Brooke O'Shaughnessy, who was uh, a doctor in the Bengal Medical Service based in Calcutta and a very much a keen amateur scientist. And as soon as news of the process arrived in Calcutta, he started experimenting and produced what we believe to be the very first photographs ever made in India. Unfortunately, None of the, his work has survived as far as we know. It was obviously very ephemeral and probably not fixed very well. So we have no examples of his work to show. But he was a very interesting man, uh, a member of the uh, Bengal Asiatic Society where he exhibited his work. And we have a record of him showing the, the first photographs, but sadly no examples to show you now. This, as far as I can ascertain, is the first known photographic image of India. It's not an original. It was presumably taken by a daguerreotype process on a metal plate in 1840. We're not sure exactly who took it. It might have possibly have been by uh, Shaughnessy, but we don't know. It's only a the only image of it was reprinted in a, a little booklet on Calcutta, published in 1910. Uh, who they did a reproduction, a lithograph reproduction from the original daguerreotype. Since then, in the last 110 years, the original daguerreotype has vanished again. So, the, but this is the earliest known image of India that we've come up with so far. The daguerreotype process became quite popular, particularly in Calcutta. Um, 
and was marketed. Several studios started up very early in the 1840s. It was an expensive fiddly process, so most of the pictures taken were of family portraits. Um, this is a slight exception. It's uh, a picture of some local people, women grinding corn. Again, we don't know who took it, but it's a nice image. Most of the pictures that survive from the 1840s tend to be family portraits. This is a nice one of Annie Princep, who's the daughter of quite a famous uh, Calcutta character, produced by Newlands in Calcutta, who were one of the first major portrait studios. Um, we don't know the exact date, the late 1840s, 1850. There's very, very little material surviving from the 1840s. This is another image under Garotype. Again, we don't know who the gentleman is and we don't know who took the picture. But I know this daguerreotype surfaced in a junk shop in Delhi about 20 years ago and found by a friend of mine. But it's a very fine portrait and has been hand tinted to give it a little extra color. The calotype process was used as well. This, again, is one of the earliest calotype or type photographs. As you can see, the quality is a lot rougher because it was using a paper negative, which was a lot coarser image. Um, this came from a little album of Himalayan images. Again, we don't know who took them, but the date seems to be very early 1840s, 1843, 1845. Um, no definitive date on it. And I think it's a little shrine on the edge of Almora, but again, not sure. People were very vague about titling images back in those days. This is possibly the first high altitude photograph taken in the Himalayas. Again, we don't know exactly who took it. I suspect it's a photographer called Oscar Melit. Uh, and it's a picture of the Milan Glacier. Again, very rare image. Um, I only know one print of it and nothing else similar. Um, very little photography was done in the high Himalayas right through till the very late 1850s and early 1860s. So this is a very rare image. And it's a three-part panorama. You can see where the camera has been rotated, three photographs taken, and then the prints actually pasted together to produce a panorama. A famous name in early photography is Dr. John McCosh, another medical man who produced a lot of fine portraiture in the early 1840s. Uh, he took photographs during the uh, First Sikh War. This is uh, a rather fine self-portrait of him wearing a, what looks to be an Afghan coat. He took portraits of some of the major participants in the Sikh campaign. This is uh, Major General Charles Napier. And again, the, there's one little surviving uh, collection of his work in the National Army Museum in London. Um, so desperately rare images. He also covered the Burma campaign in 1852 and produced some interesting, pretty much the first photographs ever taken in Burma. Another early photographer is the French traveler, Baron Alexis de Lagrange, who traveled in, in India in the late 1840s and was quite a technically competent photographer, produced some lovely views of India. Uh, and another famous, moderately famous uh, photographer in the early days was Frederick Fiebig, who was an artist in Calcutta who took up photography and produced a lot of salt print uh, photographs, views of Calcutta and Madras. 
um, a lot of which he hand tinted. Again, his work desperately rare, like so much of this material. And you can see these are all salt prints. They're all slightly coarse images, very uh, impressionistic. By the early 1850s, the photographic process had advanced somewhat with the invention of the wet plate collodion process, which involved coating a glass plate with photographic emulsion um, and sensitizing it, and then produced a very fine quality glass plate negative that could then be printed. And the quality was infinitely better than calotypes and salt prints um, and allowed of infinite reproduction. Once you produced a glass plate negative, you could then reproduce fine prints from it uh, on an industrial basis, which many commercial photographers went on to do. This is a very early Bombay photographer, Dr. Narayan Daji, um, who was a keen amateur photographer, a member of the Bombay Photographic Society, and produced a range of, of fine portraits of local people and views around the area. This is his brother, Dr. Bao Daji Lad, who you have a museum now named after, another equally keen photographer who produced some fine views around Gujarat. Um, and this is, again, a self-portrait of, of uh, Dr. Bao Daji Lad. Another early Bombay photographer, Harichan Chintaman, who was an artist and a photographer who ran a commercial studio in Bombay in the uh, 1860s. And this is uh, a self-portrait of him. He produced some interesting paintings and a lot of uh, overpainted photographs um, and had quite a successful career as a studio photographer. These are two of the photographs he produced. The one on the right is a, a CDV, a carte de visite, which was the coming craze in the early 1860s where people had their photographs taken and then printed onto a small visiting card, about two inches by three, which they would then distribute to friends and people started to collect them. It became a major collecting craze from the 1860s onwards. But he did some very fine portraiture uh, two Bengal, two photographic societies were formed in India initially, uh, the Bombay Society in 1854, and then the Calcutta Photographic Society, which produced this fine medal, which presented to photographers uh, over the years for a long time afterwards for prize-winning photographs. Madras also had a photographic society, which is slightly well known, less well known. Through the late 1850s into the 1860s, there became a tremendous increase in interest in topographical photography, and several very fine books were produced, illustrated with views of India. This one is a particularly famous one by uh, Dr. William Henry Pijou, which was published in 1866, containing photographs he'd taken in South India in Vijayanagara through the late 1850s. And he did a lot of very fine photographs of the ruins of Vijayanagara. Another famous name, Captain Linnaeus Tripe. Quite a few Indian army officers took up photography as a hobby. Uh, Captain Tripe took it up much more seriously and produced a lot of fine views, primarily of South India, several of which were produced in books, which actually had original photographs pasted into them um, in very limited editions. So these books are now desperately rare and his work is extremely sought after and commands insanely high prices at auction on the rare occasions it turns up at auction but he did some very fine views of South India.
This is an interesting little image. I don't know who the men were, but they were keen amateurs, and it gives you an idea of amateur photography in the mid-1850s with the two self-portraits of gentlemen with their cameras. Again, we no idea who they were or exactly where in India they were, but they came for an album of Indian photography um, with these extremely large sliding box cameras. The Indian mutiny period produced a lot of very interesting imagery. Um, a lot of it, most important, was done by a gentleman called Felice Beato, who came out to India specifically at the tail end of the mutiny in order to document it. And he produced a large body of pictures of, of the mutiny and the people who took part in it. Um, this is one of his more famous images of uh, the officers of Hodson, Hodson's horse, one of the impromptu regiments that was raised. He did a lot of other pictures. This is another fine one of uh, the elephant battery at Lucknow and a couple of the major officers taking part in the campaign. He produced editions of these prints, which were sent back to England to be marketed, but it wasn't a commercial success. By the time they got back to England, people had lost interest in the campaign, and very few of the photographs were actually sold in the end, so it wasn't a financial success. And he ended off going up, going to Burma and then on to Japan to carry on work out there. This is an unusual image. It's the Indian army and the British army in India started to get interested in photography as a means of recording campaigns. Um, this is an image produced by Lance Corporal Jones from the Royal Engineers. And this is uh, a view of Lucknow taken right at the end of the campaign. Um, it's almost a unique image. I, I, uh, it's now in the National Army Museum and uh, it's uh, one of a little series of prints I actually found in a junk market in England some years ago and ended up passing on to the National Army Museum. Uh, his work's otherwise pretty much unknown. If he hadn't signed the picture in the negative, we wouldn't even know who'd taken it or where it was. Well, we'd done where it was, of course. Uh, another interesting early image from the uh, relief of Lucknow was that this is an amber type, which is a positive image produced on a glass plate of a Cornet Banks of the Seventh Hussars, who won the VC for gallantry, um, but sadly died in the campaign. It appears he had literally both his arms locked off in the fight and died shortly afterwards, um, but not before he had his picture taken. Again, we don't know who took it, um, but it's a rather sombre image, uh, presumably the blankets to cover up his missing arms. It may even be have been taken after he died. It's hard to tell, but he does not look happy. The Part de visite craze took off seriously through the 1860s and it was the most economical and accessible form of photography. So lots of people could afford to have these small carte de visite portraits made. Um, these are a couple of slightly uh, unusual images, um, politically incorrect titling uh, to them, but very much... Uh, symptomatic of that period. Um, you wouldn't get away with saying that on a photograph nowadays, I'm afraid. But the the uh, picture on the right of an ayah with a baby is very interesting technically in as much as you can see this uh, metal posing stand, which is normally hidden. Norm the exposure times for these photographs were so long, sometimes you know, 10 or 20 seconds, and in order to keep people's heads still so the picture didn't become blurred, they invented this metal stand, which normally was placed behind the sitter, and a neck brace 
locked on to hold your head steady. And then the, the exposure could be made without your head vibrating. And this is unusually uh, used just to prop a baby up. And uh, you very rarely see the posing stand. Here's some other interesting uh, images. This is uh, Captain Creswell, a famous Calcutta jockey. And this one slightly later from about 1870. And this, the one on the right, is an unusual double exposure by the Calcutta studio of F.W. Baker, uh, where they've managed to do a double exposure where the man's sat on one side of the uh, camera and had his picture taken, then moved across to the other chair, and a second exposure made. As you can see in the middle, it doesn't quite match up properly, but it's uh, an amusing image. Again, a lot of uh, the British out there had their picture taken, and they often quite like to have their servants and, and their dogs and their guns included in the picture. And this is a very typical picture of, a, of an English gentleman with his, uh, his bearer and his uh, favourite dogs. Picture on the right is a quite rare picture, self-portrait of a an Indian photographer. Quite a lot of the photographers working in India initially tended to be Europeans, but also quite a number of, of Indian studios set up. This one is a chap called Nursapa, who was based in Ahmednagar in the mid 1860s. And uh, this is a picture of him with one of his cameras. One of the major works of photography produced in the late 1860s was a volume called The People of India, which was commissioned by the Indian government to document the various tribes and peoples that com that's, uh, comprised the population of the Indian subcontinent. It was a mammoth work, eight large volumes with 468 albumin print photographs which were commissioned from a large number of different photographers, both amateur and professional. And uh, it gave first real insight into the range of the different peoples and tribes and castes uh, right across the subcontinent. Again, it was a very limited work. I suspect probably only a hundred copies of it were ever printed as it was uh, exceedingly expensive. Each one had to have individual photographs printed and then pasted in. So it was technically an extremely complicated business producing these books. And now, like so many other things, desperately rare and desperately sought after. I'm going to go on in more detail with one of my favorite photographers who I've been collecting and researching for years. Um, Samuel Bourne, who went out to India in 1863 and set up a photographic studio there. He spent seven years in India, traveling around and carrying out several major expeditions in the Himalaya and produced some of the finest photographs of that period of the landscape of the, of the, uh, of the country. He set up initially in partnership with a Calcutta studio photographer, William Howard, and they set up in similar as Howard and Bourne. They were joined shortly afterwards in 1864 by Charles Shepherd, who was a professional photographer based in Agra, and it became Howard, Bourne and Shepherd. But then Howard died in 1866, and the studio became Bourne and Shepherd, under which name it was still trading right up until 2016 and was the longest established photographic studio probably in the world, certainly in India, um, and produced a colossal amount. It became the premier photographic studio of India. Even long after Bourne left, it was still producing a lot of fine imagery under various different photographers and became the semi-official photographers for the Indian government over the years. 
Samuel Bourne was, as I said, primarily a landscape photographer and his other partners stayed back in the studio and did the portraiture and processed and printed his work. In the course of his seven years in India, he did three major Himalayan expeditions. The first to the Sutlej Valley in 1863, a second more extensive one to Kashmir in 1864, and his final major expedition to Kulu, Spiti, Lahore, and the Upper Ganges in 1866, which was took him six months of traveling. Apart from that, he traveled extensively around India, producing a lot of technically very fine landscape views and architectural studies. He did very little portraiture. He left that to the other people in the studio, but he was one of the finest landscape photographers of the Indian uh, subcontinent in that period. His partners are relatively unknown compared to him. Um, William Howard, his initial partner, had a studio in Calcutta, uh, but we know very little about his life, and he died um, in 1865 of typhoid in Simla. Um, but he produced some interesting uh, portraiture and studio work. Uh, this picture he took of Lord Lawrence and the Vice Regal Council in Simla in 1864 is one of the few Howard and Bourne pictures we can definitively attribute to him. Every year, the uh, government in India in Simla commissioned a, a, a portrait study of the Vice Regal Council. So there are a series of versions of the same image produced every year where the, the figures changed slightly as members came and went. The other partner in the uh, in the studio, Charles Shepherd, was an extremely interesting man. We know slightly more about him because he was initially a clockmaker, not a photographer at all, and he came from a clockmaking family in London and invented an electric clock system, which was exhibited in 1851 for the Great Exhibition in London. He was then recruited by. Dr. Brooke O'Shaughnessy, who we've already mentioned, who was initially commissioned to set up a telegraph network in England, in India. And he commissioned Charles Shepherd as an electric clockmaker to come out and assist with the technical construction of the telegraph network in India. So he came out in 1853 and worked on the telegraph network in India. Um, but unfortunately, he left the telegraph service under a cloud for alleged financial irregularities and then set up as a photographer. Uh, exactly where and when we're not sure, but he ended up in Agra by the, in the mutiny. By 1858, was working in Agra as a photographer. He would then... His first famous image, taken in uh, collaboration with Captain Robert Teichler, another keen amateur army officer photographer, produced the well-known photograph of the uh, deposed emperor, Bahadur Shah Zafar II, before he was sent to Burma. The partnership seems to have started about 1862, when he was working together with Arthur Robertson, who was postmaster in Agra, but they then moved up to Simla in 1864, and by 1865 he joined Howard and Bourne to form Howard and Bourne and Shepherd. Much of, he took a lot of very fine topographical views and architectural studies. Most of his neg glass plate negatives were taken over by Bourne and Shepherd and produced, marketed by them as their work for many years afterwards. Eventually, Shepherd left the partnership and returned to England in 1878, uh, going back to being a clockmaker and an engineer. He eventually moved to South Sea, and in a strange irony, he, he we were, died there in 1905 and is buried in the cemetery in South Sea, uh, somewhat ironically, almost next door to the grave of Sir Brooke O'Shaughnessy, the pioneer photographer, and the man who sacked him.
And this is the photograph he and Teichler took of Bahadur Shah Zafar II, looking very sad, as he would indeed do. This is a whimsical little set of carte de visites of Charles Shepard, um, produced by Vaughan and Shepard's studio, which I acquired a few years ago. Um, this is the only known photograph of him I can find, but these are little cartoons produced by someone in, in Vaughan and Shepard's studio, possibly as a present for him, it's hard to say, but uh, an amusing little collection, which seemed to be dated to 1874. Lorna Shepard's first established studio was here on the Marlin Simla at Talbot House. And this was a photograph of it by Samuel Bourne in 1867. This is the very first image of Simla Bourne took in 1863. Picture number one of the uh, house on the Marl near Okova. He produced, as I said, a lot of very fine studies in and around Simla, quite apart from his further ventures afield. This is a lovely study of a temple down at Annandale on the edge of Simla. His first expedition to the Sutledge Valley in 1863 produced some other fine studies. This is another temple at Chergan, which again is one of my favorite images of uh, Himalayan architecture. This is bridge over the Sutledge, the bridge at Wangtu, which you can see has been through several evolutions there. This is 1863. It obviously got washed away and destroyed by floods every year or two and had to be rebuilt. So that seems to be its third incarnation. It's now been replaced with a massive road bridge as they've paved the entire valley with a tarmac road. He started to produce some very fine views of the Himalaya. This is one of his early ones at the head of the Wanga Valley. Uh, he was a master of his craft and produced technically very fine negatives and, and prints from them in a period when a lot of people were rather slapdash and produced rather streaky, stained, messy glass plate negatives. And he produced some technically very fine images, a very difficult process because this was using the wet plate collodion process where you had to take an entire darkroom with you out into the field in a, a tent and in order to make a photograph you had to, to use a large plate camera born was using a 10 by 12 inch plate camera producing 10 by 12 inch negative glass plate negatives you then had to coat the glass plate with collodion emulsion sensitive emulsion which you had to do immediately before taking the photograph and as the collodion dried after you'd sensitized it it became less sensitive so you had to coat a glass plate rush it into the camera take a photograph rush back to the dark room and process and fix and wash the image before the collodion died dried died dried um collodion was a mixture of gun cotton uh, dissolved in ether so very flammable and evaporated very quickly. Once it had dried, it became impermeable and couldn't be processed. So all the people who took photographs through the 1860s and 70s were using this process, which meant coating a plate, rushing to take the photograph, rushing back to the darkroom to process it before it became impermeable and unprocessable. This is one of the few images we have of Samuel Bourne. He did a, a second expedition to Kashmir in 1864. Um, on the route, he stopped at Chamba and he had took a picture of the Raja of Chamba, Raja Sri Singh Varman, together with his courtiers. And Bourne inserted himself into the picture together with the British resident and the local forestry officer. Um, and there were very few pictures of Bourne in India, and this is one of the nicest of them, having his picture taken with a Raja. His trip to Kashmir produced a lot of interesting uh, images of the landscape. This is another bridge. I'm afraid 
I'm subjecting you to my personal interest in Himalayan bridges here, so you'll see a lot of bridge pictures. But this is a fine one of a jeweler bridge. Um, there's not many of these left. I've walked over one or two of these in my life, traveling in the Himalayas, and it's always a scary experience. This one is made up of woven twigs, and they used to fall apart on a regular basis. So crossing them is always a character building experience. His, his 1864 expedition produced some fine studies of uh, temple architecture. This is temple at Naushira. Did a few portraits in Kashmir of some local, well, this is a group of local uh, ladies in Srinagar. He wasn't a great portraitist, but occasionally he, uh, he took a few. He went on to travel around much of the rest of northern India. Uh, this is one of his views from Fatapur Sikri, again 1866. And in a, later in 1866, he did his third and final expedition through Kulu, Lahore and Spiti and produced some stunning uh, images there. This is another of my favourite. This is a village of Kot on the edge of the Kulu Valley which is uh, yeah, one of my favorite Himalayan images of all time. It took me many years to realize that the gentleman with a turban in the middle of the picture is actually Samuel Bourne himself, who sneaked into his picture and presumably got his companion to uh, make the exposure for him. Another whimsical picture from this expedition, when he traveled the height of the Kulu Valley, the only way to cross the river was by using mussocks, which are these inflated ox or buffalo hides. So there was a pause halfway up the Kulu Valley while they managed to transship all their equipment, and there was quite a lot of it. He travelled with about 80 porters, carrying all his equipment for six months travelling, and he took this photograph of... Uh, all the Musuk men waiting to carry him across. You'll notice the tent in the middle here. This is his darkroom tent used for processing uh, the, uh, the plates in. Um, you'll also see a gentleman here who is his companion for this, this, uh, this journey. We zoom in. This is Dr. George Playfair. This is a section of that image. And you can see the darkroom tent his other camera tripods and boxes and equipment. And said he produced a lot of fine landscapes from Kulu. This is another one at Sultanpur, which is now Kulu town in the middle of the Kulu Valley. And this has all long disappeared and there's now a major road through here with an extremely ugly bridge across. It looked a lot nicer in 1866. He then went on into Spiti and produced some of the first images of Spiti, not the first, but uh, some very fine pictures of the valley. This is his study of Key Monastery, which I've visited now and to a certain extent still looks the same, uh, a bit more extended since those days. He left Spiti via the Manirung Pass, which was uh, quite a high mountain pass, which he climbed over. He went up on a yak and then spent some time at the top of the pass, which is 14 and a half thousand feet up and produced some stunning photographs of the pass itself. Um, technically extremely difficult to do with uh, the wet plate process. This um, image and the, its companion were at this point the highest altitude photographs anyone had taken anywhere in the world and it was about another 20 years before anyone managed to take any photographs at a higher altitude this is another fine view from that same trip as he's coming down the Sutledge valley again this was part of the tibet hindustan tibet highway which was the only trade route through this way going up into Tibet, but was never commercially very successful. It's, this was now then later 
bashed out into a wider Jeep road in the 1960s. So this no longer exists in the same form. He went on to visit Gangor Tree. And this, as far as I can tell, is the first picture ever of the, sh the shrine at Gangor Tree from 1866. Again, it's uh, been radically built over now and the original Mandir is buried inside a huge complex. Um, again, I think it looked rather more attractive in those days. The developments have not improved it. After he left India in 1870, he returned to England and pretty much gave up professional photography. He became a keen amateur and an artist. He founded a successful cotton business in Nottingham and became a local justice of the peace and a very successful and wealthy businessman, established a large factory, but uh, stopped doing commercial photography. Uh, he became a keen amateur and joined a local photographic society. But uh, in the end, rather denied the fact that he'd ever been a commercial photographer. Um, at the end of his life, he uh, was very coy about ever having done it for money. <laughs> The studio was then taken over by a variety of uh, different photographers over the years and uh, carried on, went into Indian ownership in 1964 and finally closed down in 2016. Unfortunately, a lot of uh, the stock of photographs that the studio had was destroyed in a fire. Uh, including most of his work. Bourne went, carried on becoming a, an amateur, keen amateur artist in his later life. These are a couple of paintings I have in my collection, watercolours done by him, one in 1880, one in 1896. The studio carried on commercially after he left. This was done while he was still there, but not by him, um, possibly by Charles Shepard. Um, produced a lot of fine photographs of the people and the landscapes of India. This is another one of his uh, pictures taken in his visit to Darjeeling. Interesting because it, um, the same image reappears in a number of forms. This is the one on the left is the original image. Someone later on managed to break the glass plate, but they carried on printing it and selling pictures of the cracked image. The same image was then used for a variety of other illustrations over the years. This one has turned into a wood engraving um, in another book of uh, pictures of India and was later marketed as postcards. This was being sold about 50 years after he took the original image. So it, uh, it had a long shelf life. Uh, when Bourne left, his work as a photographer was taken over by Colin Murray, a Scotsman, who then went on to develop the studio and bought out the studio entirely after Charles Shepard left. And he produced a lot of fine work, topographical views of India, particularly Rajasthan. Um, he was very much the equal of Bourne in producing uh, fine technical work. He also produced some of the earliest work in Nepal, was commissioned by uh, Jung, <coughs> Jung Bahadur to go to Kathmandu to produce some family photographs and a byproduct took some fine views around Kathmandu. This is a lovely one of uh, the stupa at Budnath, again, about 1873. Uh, from the same series, this is uh, Dava Square in Patan. You'll notice here that uh, whereas Bourne's images were just signed Bourne, uh, Colin Murray's, he signed them Bourne and Shepherd. So if you see anything signed Bourne and Shepherd, it's not by Samuel Bourne, it's by Colin Murray. He wasn't the first man to photograph in Nepal. And uh, in 1863, 
uh, another Indian Army officer, Karen Captain Clarence Comin Taylor, visited and was working in uh, in Kathmandu, and was a keen amateur. He produced what seemed to be the very first photographs known of Nepal. Um, reasonably good technical quality, um, but he was only an amateur. They weren't sold commercially, so the images are extremely rare. There's very few of them known. And this was one of the portraits that uh, Bourne and Shepherd did later. They became the semi-official photographers for the Indian government, and they did. Uh, they covered all the big Delhi Durbars, 1877, 1903, and 1911, and did a lot of uh, portraiture of all the Maharajas who came to the Durbar. And this is their one of Jung Bahadur. And they did several views of the Durbar. The Durbars grew in stature over the years. The 1871, 80, sorry, 1877 one seems rather modest compared to the two later ones. This is uh, from the 1903 Durbar, and you see all the gentlemen of Bourne and Shepherd Studio um, posing with all their equipment outside their studio tent in uh, Delhi. Uh, you'll notice here, this is a 35 millimeter film camera. Uh, and they started to experiment with uh, filmmaking and produced a short film of the Delhi Durbar. This is another one from uh, the 77 Durbar of uh, Maharaja of Dangradra. Like most other studios, they produced a whole range of carte de visites. Here's some examples front and back of. Uh, the various uh, carts, um, desperately popular through the 1860s and 70s onwards, and most people collected them and shared them with their friends and family and bought ones of famous people. Um, these are some other ones. This is uh, quite a famous image of Roger Kipling done by Bourne and Shepherd. This is an interesting one. This is uh, Colonel William Auchinleck, who was the father of uh, Field Marshal Sir Claude Auchinleck, the Indian Army commander in the Second World War. Um, interesting, it's taken on his on his horse, and this is taken outside the Talbot House studio in Simla. A lot of uh, Bourne and Shepherd's work was, uh, as I said before, marketed as postcards from the 1900s onwards. So these are a, a, an assortment of uh, Bourne and Shepherd published postcards, most of which are by Bourne, but not all of them. The studio eventually closed down in Simla. Uh, they had had a branch in Calcutta from the 1860s, but they amalgamated all their studios. They even had a branch in Bombay for a while. And they moved everything down to Simla in 1910 to a newly built studio, closed the Simla studio down entirely, and then <clears throat> carried on in Calcutta right through uh, until finally closing in 2016. You see at the back of the building here on the left, party missing, they had a major fire in 1991, which destroyed their entire archive, all of Samuel Bourne's original glass plate negatives and their entire archive of 100 years of photography went up in smoke. Um, one of the great photographic catastrophes on the planet because it would colossal archive of Indian history, which disappeared in one go, should have been the core of an Indian national photographic archive, but sadly it was not to be. The studio carried on in Simla. Uh, it was taken over by another photographer for a while and then turned into a hotel and then to uh, a lawyer's offices. And then this is a picture I took of it in 1996, falling apart, uh, but was then later demolished and is now a hotel once again called a Le Talbot Hotel. These are... Photographic postcards produced in the 1900s. Um, this is interesting because it's a woman showing uh, 
uh, making money, showing a peep show, showing uh, stereo cards. Um, presumably you pay a few paisa and uh, get to peep in. Um, whether they were naughty pictures or not, we don't know. I'm jumping forwards and backwards a bit in time here. This is uh, going back to some pictures of Spitty. This is another early amateur photographer, uh, Philip Henry Egerton, who was uh, an Indian uh, government official who travelled through Spitty in 1863 and did some wonderful photographs of the people and the landscape of Spitty. Again, and produced in a very limited government report with pasted in photographs incredibly rare nowadays but some fine studies of the people of uh, of spitty and these were the earliest photographs of spitty taken even before born went there moving on to another contemporary of samuel born john sachet who was uh, another very interesting photographer um originally german as far as we know who traveled around the world he worked in america for a while and then finally ended up in India, had a studio in Calcutta for a while, and then settled in Nainital. Um, this is uh, a self-portrait of him looking extremely dapper. And I'm fortunate enough to find a small collection of photographs by him uh, produced for his family, which very unusually show a lot of his studio work. This is he did a lot of traveling, like many photographers, traveling around India with sort of uh, doing seasonal work in various uh, towns and hill stations. And this is a fine example of his uh, photograph temporary photographic studio cobbled together with bamboo and grass. And you can see the developing tent that he processed the plates in and then a studio area inside with... Uh, large uh, <clears throat> cloths to try and shade the sunlight to control the lighting and there's another one here of a similar one he, he had um, and again he is posing outside his studio he produced a lot of you know, fine portrait studies um, these are some of the ones from Calcutta of uh, local trades in Calcutta he did some Himalayan expeditions uh, as well as Bourne, and this is one along up the Pindar Valley, where he did some fine views of the landscape of the Pindar Valley. And this is uh, his view of the bazaar at Almora. And he spent a lot of time in Missouri as well, and did some fine views of Missouri. And this again is Missouri in the mid 1860s. Sadly, it doesn't look like that anymore. But then few places in Himalaya do nowadays. He did some lovely views of Bombay. This is the, po the old post office in uh, Bombay, again about 1865. This is his studio in Lucknow, as far as we can tell. They said he moved around, he would be in Nainital in the hot season and down in Lucknow in the cool weather. And this is uh, John Sashi again. You see his wife in the carry out, carriage outside the studio, and this gentleman at the back is his son, Alfred, who took over the studio in Lucknow. And several of his sons became professional photographers over the following years. This is another one of his views from uh, Kashmir. He did a lot of work in Kashmir. This is uh, a nice one of uh, the Bridge of Akbar. Um, as a popular motif for photographers to uh, to Kashmir. This is Samuel Bourne's version of the same bridge. And this is another one of the same bridge by Baker and Burke, who are another uh, important mid 19th century studio uh, based in, in Murray. And they did a lot of very fine work in Kashmir. Um, John Burke was also involved in documenting the Second Afghan War and produced a lot of uh, important images of the uh, the Afghan campaign. This is a fine study by him of uh, Kabul with the Bala Hissar gate. Uh, may I uh, come in very quickly, Hugh? It's yes, 7.10, yeah. just for your information. 
Oh, right. You want me to wind up? I'll, yeah. In, in say, about five minutes, because we okay, have right. questions. I'll, I'm getting towards the end. I'll, I'll, I'll speed up. Thank you. I get carried away by my own verbosity. Right. Um, so really quickly, another important early studio was Francis Frith, the English photo uh, publishers who in, commissioned a lot of work in India and produced a lot of fine work um, attributed to several of photographers they uh, commissioned. James Craddock, another important Kashmir photographer who did a lot of work in uh, Kashmir and elsewhere. This is one of his views in Simla. The gentleman John de Murray see here with the beard is also another important early photographer in India. And this is another early view of Simla. Uh, this is one of a typical example of the photographs the British had taken of themselves. Uh, we don't know who these people were or even who took the picture, but it's mid 1870s. And uh, I thought quite a characterful picture uh, of uh, British and uh, Indian group. Also, British were also extremely obsessed with fancy dress parties and uh, had lots of bizarre pictures taken of themselves in fancy dress. At the same time, a lot of photographers produce interesting studies of local businesses. This is another one by Captain Lyon, another famous uh, photographer from uh, Utkamun in South India, did a lot of fine work. Another one of my favourite Himalayan images of a still. <laughs> Major Robert Gill, another famous name, who spent a large chunk of his life at Ajanta and Ellora, producing a tremendous photographic documentary of the region, and produced several books of uh, fine photographs of the cave complexes. Famous Indian photographer Raja Lala Deen Dayal, who produced a lot of superb images of, uh, of India and established a major studio which carried on and he's still, I think, notionally still in business, but he produced some very, very fine images. And this is the man himself with uh, his uh, two assistants, Percy Herzog and Percy Higgins, who worked for him initially and then went on to establish their own studio in Mao. And this is an unusual set of pictures of the interior of their studio, give you an idea of what a Victorian... Um, photo studio. This is their sort of reception rooms look like. Again, very unusual to see pictures of photographic studio interiors from that period. Another famous studio from South India, Vila and Klein, the Germans originally, who like many other German photographers came out to India, based in Madras and Utkamund. Uh, Thomas Parr, another famous German photographer based in Simla, sorry, Simla, Darjeeling. Uh, this is his studio which is uh, in Charasta, which is uh, now a hotel, but the building still stands. One of the pictures, he took a lot of pictures of uh, Darjeeling life and people in and around Darjeeling. Uh, this is one of my favourite uh, personalities, a lady, we don't know her name, but she was called the Witch of Gloom, who appeared on the Darjeeling Railway in the 1900s. And everyone took photographs of her. She looks to be a great character. And I, again, I'm afraid I collect pictures of her. <laughs> um, Delhi Durbar, a lot of uh, stereo cards were produced of India. And this is a series produced by Underwood in America, which documented the Delhi Durbar of 1903. It's another whimsical image. Uh, we don't know who it is, but uh, an interesting picture of... Uh, an Englishman with his chaprasi. Uh, this is a sort of fine art study produced by a member of uh, a photographic society and entered in a photographic competition. It's almost certainly not a tramp at rest. I'm sure it's one of his servants coerced into posing in the, uh, on the veranda. Um, this is again Dagshai Bazaar in the Himalaya and you can see a local photographic store. Presumably it was taken by them dated about 1910, an interesting uh, view of a studio in a hill station. 
And that's it, I'm afraid. Uh, as I said, I'm sorry I went on a bit too long, but uh, I could have gone on for many, many more hours, I'm afraid, but uh, everything must have an end. So anyway, I hope uh, hope you enjoy that. And uh, if anyone's interested, I've produced a lot of assorted books on uh, photography in India. You're welcome to uh, have a look at my website and uh, even buy a book if you feel like it. Okay. Thank you Thank very you much so for much. your attention. Thank you so much, you. It was going down a trip. I won't say memory lane, but yeah. it was so fascinating to see all those pictures. And you could ma make out a difference between pictures of, say, the 1860s and the 1910s and the way they were dressing yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. Tell us, yeah. to, uh, to what do you attribute the very quick adoption of photography in India so soon after it was formally said to have been uh, invented? Well, it, it seemed it, no one really is very badly documented from the early 1840s. We know a sort of one man who was an amateur scientist who became obsessed with it for a while and then lost interest. Um, how many other people in 1839, 1840 were experimenting? We really don't know. Very little was written down. Uh, there may have been people all over India experimenting, mm -hmm. uh, actually, you know, acquiring the equipment to do it in those days. You know, it meant virtually building your own camera. Uh, until they were started to be marketed commercially in India and later in the 1840s, they were being started to be produced commercial cameras in in Europe and then shipped out to India. So in the early days, you had to literally build your own camera out of you know a microscope lens and some making a wooden box. Uh, mm -hmm. So it was very experimental, and uh, that's why virtually none of it has survived, and we don't know. The names of hardly anybody who was actually pioneering photography. Uh, O'Shaughnessy was the only real name we know, purely because it was noted in the Journal of the Bengal Asiatic Society. Otherwise, we wouldn't know anything about him. So did any of the early photographers publish books about photography and their photographic experiences? Um, not the early photographers. I mean... Samuel Bourne wrote, we, I know the reason we know a lot about him is because he published regular letters to the British Journal of Photography in the 1860s, documenting his work in India and his particularly his expeditions. These were published in series in the magazine. Um, so we know a lot about where he went and, and, and what he did. Very few other photographers did until much later on. I, as I said, I've republished one or two other works. Um, a much later photographer, Randolph Holmes, in the 1900s, 1920s, travelled in Kashmir and documented his work. Um, Frederick Bremner, another studio photographer, um, in the 1920s, well, in the, by 1940, he published an autobiography of his Indian time in India running a photographic studio. But uh, very few photographers, you know, out, would publish odd articles in photographic magazines and journals. But there wasn't a great swell of people documenting their photographic endeavours in, in writing autobiographies. I wish there had been. I mean, it's uh, it yes. makes being a photographic Our historian loss. pretty difficult try it when you've got so few written sources who are having to get snippets out of photographic magazines and try and guess at who was doing what and where and when. So there's a question from Suki, who is herself a photographer. Mm -hmm. What kind of challenges did these early photographers face? I'm sure one of the, one of them must have been rough terrain when they uh, uh, traveled in the Himalayas and stuff. So what uh, other challenges would they have faced? Well, I mean... <laughs> How long do you want to go on for? A huge number. <laughs> the, the, the technical challenges of, A, learning how to do the process, um, very poorly documented initially, of acquiring the chemistry and the materials to do it. Uh, it was a while before manufacturers in Europe were producing photographic supplies and selling them in India. So actually sourcing the chemicals and the materials was a problem. Um, once you've got the materials, you have difficulties 
you know, about conti uh, contending with the heat, uh, particularly in the Indian climate, because the the early wet plate process, as I said, was gun cotton dissolved in ether and the ether would evaporate really quickly in hot weather. So whereas you could in Europe in cold weather, you could have maybe half an hour to process your plate in hot weather in India, you might got 10 minutes before the heat evaporated the plate and it became insensitive. So there are any number of technical issues. Uh, dust was an enormous problem. You know, India is a very dusty place. So you get slightest trace of a dust storm and you get specks of dust sticking to your glass plate before you'd finish processing it. Mm. Uh, I mean, I could go on chapter and verse with a number of technical issues that people overcame. Uh, sure. It got easier to the end of the 19th century when the, the gelatin dry plate process came out and you could literally buy rolls of film ready to go and put in a camera and people started to take their own photographs and you could buy a Kodak camera and take snapshots and it became you no longer had to actually manufacture your own materials. Um, so it got easier as the 19th century progressed. But it wasn't really till the 1900s it became simple and you know a manageable process that anyone could do okay uh staying with suki her next question is of a social nature did no. the artists who were painting in that period treat photography as an extension of portraiture or did they consider it as a threat to their art um i think some of the early artists people like uh Frederick Fiebig, who was an artist and a lithographer who embraced photography as an extension of, of his art. Um, I don't think that many uh, artists saw it as a threat. It was, especially in its early days, it was a relatively primitive process. Um, so I don't think it, you know, obviously some people might have done, um, it's a difficult question to put yourself in the mind of 19th century artists. True, true. Um, a, a question, you, you've talked about, I mean, you've showed us some pictures which were titled self-portraits. So yeah. the question was, how would these photographers click self-portraits? Right. With, with without selfies being with, so popular. You, well, you, you needed an assistant. You needed to set up the camera, focus it on a stand, go around the front and sit and you needed a studio assistant who was actually going to make the exposure to literally take a, a cap. I mean, the lens would have had a cap on it and you then have to get an assistant once you pre-focused it to the right spot, get an assistant to take the cap off the lens, count whatever, five, 10 seconds and put the cap back on while you stood still. So, uh, Taking selfies in the early days was always at least a two-man process. Um, it wasn't until the late 19th century when uh, mechanical shutters came in and people evolved uh, cable releases so you could actually reset a camera up and have a cable release in one hand hidden and press the shutter from a distance and take your own picture. But that's, you know, we're talking 1880s, 1890s onwards before that really came in. Before then, it was a two-man process, at least. I have a question about Felice Vieto. There are a lot of recent historians who say that his photographs were staged in order oh, yes. to uh, uh, show the horrors of the first war of independence or the, in, or the rebellion. Absolutely, yes. No, some of them were very definitely... Uh, I mean, he, he the problem he had was he came out, he didn't arrive in uh, in India until the campaign was over. So he was rushing round the sites of the various battles um, and he had to do some reconstructive work. I mean, there's, you know, famous picture of, of Lucknow where he had actually acquired a lot of... Uh, bones and skulls and skeletons and laid them out in the courtyard but you know you wouldn't dream of doing that nowadays but um he did it for better or worse and several other images you it it was a period where you couldn't take spontaneous war photography 
you know, whatever you were photographing, you photographing a campaign, you you could take pictures of the participants and staged groups of of uh, soldiers and their officers posing in, in a group photograph. But it was technically impossible to photograph a battle scene. So he made some rather tasteless attempts to reconstitute the views, um, which, as as we know, are rather disparaged nowadays. Yes. Um, and I have a last question. Yes, Do we yes. know where Born and Shepherd was located in Bombay? Uh, yes, Rampart Row. They had a studio uh, in the fort uh, on Rampart Row, which uh, ran for a while in the 1890s, and it seems to have closed down by 1910. Okay. That's all the questions we have. You Thank you so much for your time. It's okay, been a real you. pleasure. Thank you, audience, to keep on following us on social media and do attend all our talks and our walks. Thanks again, you. Okay, my pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. I hope everybody enjoyed it. Everybody did, I'm sure. <laughs> okay. No, the people are already asking when this will be up on our YouTube channel. So that is one indication. I'll okay, just so read out some other comments. Lovely collection of pictures. Love the pictures. Thank you for this journey through old pictures. Very hard to say which is my favorite picture. There are so many. And so on and on. Okay, good. Well, I'm glad people enjoyed it. Yeah, I, let me know when it turns up on YouTube. I love watching myself on YouTube. Sure, thank you. <laughs> okay, thanks very much anyway. Thank you. Okay, goodbye. <laughs>